thank you for praying for my wife. She came down with uh, sickness last week, and uh, everything is okay. Got a good praise report from the doctor that the cyst is benign. So thank you for praying. Speaking of generosity, when we are generous, it is also contagious. If sickness is contagious, generosity is contagious. So speaking of uh, generosity, we thank God for this company. It's called Garden Fresh, based in Woodenville, Washington. They're a big company supplying the big restaurants here in Washington. When they saw our giveaway, our community outreach, they contacted our office and praised the Lord. This coming June 6, you will see this truck uh, park in our in our church uh, parking lot, this refrigerator truck with more than 200 meals to be given away to the family. Can we just give a shout out to Jesus for that and thank God for Garden Fresh for partnering with us. And we are also in the process of uh, uh, contacting Chick-fil-A and we're going to buy Chick-fil-A on us. And then one Saturday, because they're closed on Sunday, we're going to have free Chick-fil-A to our community. We live to give and we love to give. And thank you, Charisma Partners. We don't have big donors. We don't have big sponsors. It's only because of your faithfulness that partnering with us, even we are not seeing in person, you're faithfully sending your tithes by a mail, a text, and, uh, and online. So way to go. The mission of God is continuing. We're spreading the love of Jesus. So just a reminder to all of us, our Facebook platform is really, a, a, God is using it mightily now. We have more than 3,000 people on the weekend from Thursday to Sunday watching us from prayer meeting to our live Sunday service. Now, we have another platform probably you don't know. We have a YouTube channel. So if you are a subscriber to YouTube, would you please uh, subscribe to Charisma Christian Center. That's the name of our YouTube channel. So that's the good news. Garden Fresh is partnering with us. Now let's talk about bad news. I'm sure they're everywhere. And just this week, somebody called me up and said, Pastor, could you help me out? How do I deal with too much bad news? And I think this question is very relevant. And I'm sure all of us probably are thinking this way. Sometimes you are so afraid to turn on the news or to read the newspaper or go to Twitter or Facebook because all you see is all the bad news, and the scenario of doom and gloom and the sky is falling. So how do we deal with bad news? So I check out the latest survey according to the Pew Research Center, two-thirds, imagine that two-thirds of us worn out by news. The other day I was, uh, I talked to one of our people and he's not affected with COVID-19, but he was affected with the spirit of fear and it led to anxiety and depression and sometimes the, this person was telling me, Pastor, I cannot even go to sleep. I'm always thinking of the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario. And just by listening to this person, and he, he even uh, diagnosed himself, it's because I've been watching too much news. And we are worn out by news. And sad to say, if you are looking at the news media today, how many of you could just decipher and just realize we are worn out by divisive political posts and news, depending on what channel you're watching. You could just sense where are they leaning toward Democrat or they're leaning toward the Republican, they're leaning toward uh, the Independent. So you could see that we are very divided when it comes to receiving this news that we are getting right now. So there are two options. The number one option is suppress it. When you say suppress it, it's like you deny it. You don't listen, you don't watch, just watch Netflix 
and watch all the Korean drama in the world because you don't want to be watching the, the news, that's good. Probably it could help you out. But come to think of it, the problem with that is you're not aware with what's going on. But the problem when you're trying to suppress something, have you ever done this during summer when you are out there swimming at the pool, you have a, a beach volleyball and you're trying to put it under the water, you're putting your whole weight into it and trying to, to, to bury on under the water the, the ball, what happened? After a while, it just popped up. So even you suppress it, evidently it will go and you will see all this news. That is one of the options. The other option is different. Suppress it is totally black out the media, the Twitter account, the, the, the social media, the news. The, the other thing is obsess. There are some people that are addicted to news. They start the morning with the news. They eat lunch watching the news. They go to bed watching the news. And no wonder they are depressed and fearful because let me just tell you this. The, the, the agenda of the news is to make us fearful. The more you watch the news and the more you get afraid, the more they get paid. That's, that's how the business goes. That's how the, it, it generates sponsorship. And some people are just so obsessed. So can I just suggest to us from the Bible, this is the third option. I call this the living hope in the midst of bad news. We're not denying the bad news, but we're adding the living hope. Where do I get this? God gave me this promise that I've been claiming every day, Psalm 112, verse 6 to 7. You know, I'm still old school, even though we are not seeing in person, but when it comes to the Word of God, we just want you to stop and, and pause whatever you're doing, and would you stand up with me, charisma, even you're watching uh, online or in your, in your room, in your, in your, in your uh, wherever you are right now, just stop for a moment, there's, the Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing the word. Fear comes from hearing and hearing and hearing the bad news. Faith comes by hearing and hearing, hearing the good news. We want the good news to come in so that faith will grow. At the count of three, one, two, three, the righteous will never be shaken. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. Let's read it again. This is powerful. The righteous will never be shaken. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. You can now be seated. I want you to see here it's very, very, very balanced. The Bible is amazing. The Bible did not say the righteous will never be shaken because they don't hear bad news. The Bible did not say that. What the Bible said, the righteous will never be shaken because they do not fear bad news. Meaning to say, you're not suppressing it, you're not obsessed with it, you're aware, you're informed what's going on in the world, this COVID-19, this pandemic with, with, the, with, the, with all that's happening, but you don't fear the bad news. You know why? Because you are confidently trust the Lord to care for them. So here is my suggestion to all of us watching online. How do I deal with the constant bad news? Here's the big idea. See bad news. I'm not telling you to stop watching. Watch, be aware in the light of good news. See bad news in the light of good news. So here's a a classic story of watching an event and some people will share some bad news and some people will share some good news. Let me just tell you the story. Let's all read this together. Numbers 13, 1 and 2. Everybody read this together. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to, everybody say explore. Explore the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan means the promised land, which I am giving to the Israelites. 
From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So let me just tell you the background. They already passed the slavery in Egypt. For two years now, they're on the way to the promised land. They are now at the border. They are now at the border. They could see the promised land. Wow. The land blessed, flowing with milk and honey. No more slavery. And God says, time out. Before you go there, I need you to explore it. Check it out. So God told Moses, pick the best of the best among the 12 tribes. Pick the leader of each tribe. And God sent them to explore the land. And they check it out. And some reported with good report and some with negative report. So this is typical what's happening in our world right now. We are seeing it right before our eyes. Some are being affected with anxiety and fear and depression. But some people are looking at it with the sense of hope and peace that God will provide and God is in control. Let me start off like this with an object lesson. Could you please tell me what do you call this? Help me out, guys. It's not a trick question. What is this? Soda? Now, when I first came to Seattle from the Philippines, in the Philippines, we call it soft drink. So when I first came to Seattle, I went to the store, can I have a soft drink? They don't understand me. Because they don't call soft drink, this, this, uh, this object soft drink in Seattle. What do they call it in Seattle? Pop. Can I have a pop? When I moved to California, so went to the store, feeling... Uh, Okay, I'm a little bit Americanized now. Can I have a pop? The Californians don't know what is a pop. They call it about pop culture, pop media. They don't call this pop in LA. They call it soda. If you go to if you go to East Coast, you know what they call this? Coke. Same object, different perspective, different names. What do you call this? To the young people, what do you call this? Sneakers. But let me tell you my, my age. When I was growing up, we don't call this sneakers. We call it tennis shoes. Remember that? Tennis shoes. Even though you don't know how to play tennis, you call it tennis shoes. If it is not a dress shoes, it is called tennis shoes. Now you don't call it, okay, can I buy a tennis shoes? No, 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 oh, how old, you're so old. You call it a sneaker. Tennis shoes, sneaker. What about this one? I'm sure you have this. What do you call this? You know what the young people call this? Flip-flops. We call it sandals. In the Philippines, we call it Sinelas. But you know what they call this in Australia? They call it tong. <laughs> why, why, why I like your tong. Don't, different names, but the same object. That's why if you travel, you go to different places, sometimes you, you will be culture shocked with some of the words that you use, like uh, we have some Italian missionaries. When our Italian friends are, went to America, to the Bible school in, in the Northwest University, they said, hey, after the class, let's go to the bar. And some of the people from the Bible school, what? Go to the bar. Because what we thought of bar is drinking and getting drunk. In Italy, when you go to the bar, it's a coffee shop. That's like a Starbucks. So different names, sometimes different way you see it. That's an object lesson. So now going to the scripture, did you know 12 spies went inside the promised land and they have different names or different ways they see the promised land? 
So the first thing that we need to do is, let's go first to the map. So we will see. So this is history. So they were slaves in Egypt. And then they crossed the Red Sea. They were all the way to the Sinai Peninsula, to the Mount Sinai, the giving of the ten, the, the ten Commandments and all these things. And now they're entering the promised land. That is the land of Canaan. So that is where it happened. God sent the 12 spies to look out and check out, explore the land. So how do we handle bad news? Let's learn from the scripture. Number one, see the facts. See the facts, especially nowadays, right? There's a lot of fake news. That's why you need to be like a... a an investigative uh, person checking out the news that where you're getting it from. There's some conspiracy theory here. There's some, there's some people saying this, some people saying that. So sometimes you need to understand the facts. What do we see from the CDC? Facts of coronavirus, not fear. See the facts. Wash your hands. Wear the glove. And, and social distancing. Let's see the facts. That's part of that. what we need to do. But don't go into the pandemic uh, with, with fear and, and anxiety because that will only lower your immune system. And when your immune system is low, you could be susceptible to the sickness. So let's look at the facts. So here's the two reporters. Moses and Caleb, they came back to Moses and look at what they said. Let's read this together. They gave Moses this account. So it's a report. Like they're giving the report. It's like a newscaster. This is what we see. We went into the land to which you sent us. Yes, it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. What is that? See the fact. Object lesson, they brought a cluster of grapes and it took two people to carry a cluster of grapes. Could you just imagine that? When you go to Israel today, you look at the, 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 the building and you look at the taxi cabs, the, the, the bus, the tour bus, you will see this. This is the insignia and the logo of Israel Ministry of Tourism. You know those two guys? That's Joshua and Caleb carrying a cluster of grape. They were the first tourists to enter Israel. And they were the first tourists who did not complain. <laughs> and the rest of us, we complain. So this is what they said. We saw it. Here is the fruit. But look at the other group, the next reporters. Look at this. Check this out. Hear me out. Whenever you talk to a friend and his start of the sentence is but, meaning to say what you're saying, I'm going in a different direction. <laughs> That's why there's a contrast. So here's what the two said. Here is the fruit. It's a land blessed, flowing milk, honey. And here comes the 10 people. But, different direction, but the people... Living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, descendants of Enoch. Nothing bad with that. They're just reporting the facts. Coming from a negative uh, point of view, but it's good to be aware. Yeah, there's fruit. There's blessing. But there's also giants. There's also big people there. There's also a problem. And that's good. That is seeing the facts. You are balanced, looking at from a different perspective, from, from different point of view. And then they, they say, even said, the Amalekites living in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Those are the people occupying the promised land. If this will be in the new quarantine version today, our enemies is what we call the cellulite. 
<laughs> How many of you have seen the cellulite appeared again in your body, right? In this three months or two months, we've been quarantined, right? So the, these are the enemies, right? So now, after you see the facts, follow me, church, very important. You see the facts, and then you see the facts in the light of God's promise. That is how you handle bad news. You are aware. You're not denying it. You're not an ostrich in, uh, on the sand that, in the sand that's put, putting your, your, your head under the sand as if that nothing is, is denial. No, no, don't do that. You need to be aware. But now, after you have seen the problem, yeah, there's a coronavirus. Don't deny it. People are dying. We see it happening. It's all over the world. Now see the facts in the light of God's promises. Listen to this. Numbers 13, 1, 2. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. What does it mean? When you enter the promised land, there'll be giants, there'll be problems, there'll be battles there, but I have given it to you. That is your manna. That is your possession. That is my promise to you. So I challenge us, while we're going through this pandemic, we are all affected of this, but see, this is just a season that all of us are going through. And while we're going through the season, we have a promise that God will never leave us nor forsake us. Come on, somebody. We have a promise that the Lord's blessing will be upon us. We have a promise that while we're walking uh, as if that the wall is still humongous and we cannot penetrate the wall, we know that God did it before and God will do it again. What we're doing is we're not denying the facts, but we're seeing it in the light of the promise of God. So, you know what? Whenever you watch the news, you see the facts, and then you analyze it. It is just like you're not just viewing the facts. You are writing a story. That's why every newscaster, before they report a news, they already have a narrative. They have already a story. Or you might say they already have an agenda and they're going to use this coronavirus, they're going to use this uh, layoff, they're going to use the sickness, the, the agenda of fear, the agenda of, of shutting the government and shutting uh, the economy. They have, and they're using the facts, but they already have a written story. Now, what is your story? What are you writing during this pandemic? I just want to challenge you from the scripture. Look at how Caleb writes the story of his life. You know, somebody once said, it's possible to look at the same thing with different point of view. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> you have your side, but you have the missus side is always the right side. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about, right? So here's what Caleb said. Caleb quieted the people. Would you just say this with me? Caleb quieted the people before Moses. And this is what he said. Let us go up once and take possessions for we are well able. Everybody say we are well able. Come on, let's type it in. We are well able. Make that your declaration. We are well able. We are well able to overcome it. That is the story. Have you noticed? That is the analysis and the story that they're trying to paint. This will be the outcome of our future. We are well able to overcome this virus. We are well able to overcome this pandemic. We are well able to overcome this crisis. They're looking at this from a point of view that God has given us this this land for them, and they're claiming it. It's ours. We are well able to overcome it. Now, I want to challenge all of us. Church, let's be counterculture. Don't be echoing what is the majority report. Remember, the majority is always negative. 
the majority report is always negative. Even though you're just one person who believe in what God says about you, stand on it. You are called not to blend in. You are called to stand out. One person, Caleb, quieted the people. You know how many? Millions. They're, oh, millions. They are in the wilderness complaining and whining and crying out. And then, hush, quiet. Let us go up once to take possession for we are well able. The power of one. Let me tell you a true story. One of my favorite story in the travel to Rome is you go to Rome, you see this Colosseum, right? This is a true story of uh, a monk. His name is Telemachus. Telemachus came from Syria in a province of Syria. God told him one day, you go to Rome. I have a mission for you. So he went to Rome and you know what? The highlight of the city of Rome is the Colosseum. It's humongous. But we all know what's happening inside the Colosseum. It is a place of entertainment. And the, play, the, the way they entertain themselves back in the day is a little bit brutal. They have like a UFC fight inside the Colosseum. And then fight till you die. Sometimes the gladiator will fight the beast. Sometimes the beast will fight the, 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 the Christians and they'll be fed to the Christian. It's the, the, the kind of entertainment. Imagine you are a guy from a province of Syria, a Christian dude, went there and went inside the Colosseum. When he is seeing the brutal people are laughing and cheering on and people being killed, you know what this guy did? All the way from the, from the top, marched down all the way to the, to, the, to the ground floor. And he jumped inside the ring where there's a gladiator fighting. And the, the, the emperor was there. And then the emperor gave the, the signal. So he was stabbed and to death by a gladiator. This Christian dude jumped inside the ring. And he was stabbed to death. While he was dying, all of a sudden the people were starting to clapping. All of a sudden have a sense of remorse. Looking at this innocent man being stabbed to death and started walking out of the Colosseum. Church, you know how it ends? Those brutal games? Because of one man, his name is Telemachus, one man who jumped and gave his life. And ever since then, that brutal killing of people as a point of entertainment stopped. If you want to check out history, that is according to 457 AD. It's all over that the, the annals of history in the city of Rome, but the death of Telemachus crystallize the opposition so that never again was there a gladiatorial fight ever fought in the Colosseum. One person stood against the culture, the culture of killing, entertaining themselves when they see people being brutally killed, jump into the ring. And then all of a sudden, Con begin conscious again. This is, is this humanity? We are laughing at people being killed. And that is how they stop that brutal game called the gladiator fights inside the Colosseum. The power of one. Caleb was only one. But he stood for his conviction. If God says this is ours, let's claim it. Against millions of people who said, there's giants, we cannot do it. Can I just ask you a question for those of you who are also watching online? Were you born in a Christian family? Meaning to say, you were born in a family that goes to church on Sunday. The Bible is being read to you in the morning, in the evening. You know the, the songs of the church, the blessing. Or were you... 
the first one who became a Christian in your family. I remember the story of one of our leaders, the wife of Raymond, Michelle, who's one of the people faithfully what, leading us to this media ministry. She's up there in the balcony right now. I remember her story. You can make the difference, the power of one. She was the first Christian in the family. And in the family, they all believe in a different religion. And she stood for Jesus Christ. She was persecuted. She was hated. But now, almost all of his relatives are believers. Every Sunday, when I watch our online service, I'm going to give a shout out to our future family and friends in, in Olongapo. I could see the relatives of Michelle, amen, sending emoji heart, watching it. And then you see, because she stood for what she believed, then the rest is history. The family came to Jesus Christ. The power of one. You know, sometimes the problem is we get so enamored with the groupies. We get so enamored with the hundred followers, thousands of likes. You know, God is not impressed with that. He's just looking for one man, one lady who will believe God and stand in his word. And let me tell you, one plus God, you are a majority in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. One plus God. You only need the one yes. You only need one yes, you, one like. Jesus like you, and Jesus says yes to you, you're okay. Caleb silenced the people, and he stood because he is writing a story. But look at the other story being written too, just to be balanced. Look at verse 30. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they're stronger than we are. That's their story. And they're sticking to it. We are not able. The story of Caleb, we are well able. The story of the majority, we are not able. Now listen to me carefully. Did you know that there's power in your words? A lot of times we're defeated because we are hung by our tongue. Oh, I'm not going to make it. Oh, I'm going to die. Oh, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna have a good breaks in my life. That's your story? That's the narrative, your story that you're painting? Did you know that your tongue is like the brush or the, the pen of the story of your life? Listen, what happened to them? Here's the thing, church, what consumes your mind, control your life. That's why, church, if you're watching the news and you, you, you get fearful, turn off the news. Because it's consumed you. Instead of being hopeful in life, instead of, of doing what you're supposed to do, you find yourself sitting in one corner and having a self-pity party, and then you're crying yourself, and then you cannot go to sleep because you've been consumed with what you've been watching and what you've been touching with your mind. It will control your life. That's what happened to the spies. They were consumed by what they were thinking the negative and the worst case scenario. You know, we all know the optimist, right? We are well able. That's Caleb. The pessimist, we are not able. You know, I, I want to give you a definition of an optimist from the Christian perspective. It's not just a powerful, positive thinking, no. Optimism is the unwavering expectation that our loving God is working every situation for our future good. I want to say it again. Optimism is the unwavering expectation that our loving God is working every situation for our good. Can I ask a question and answer me what's the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? At the sound of my voice, those who are watching online, answer me, okay? Because this is a very important question. Answer me what comes to your mind. The first thing that comes to your mind. When you think about God, what comes to your mind? When you think about God, what comes to your mind? Because it reveals what you think about Him and your belief. 
for those of you who've been following your pastor for years now, if you're going to look at all my sermon, there's only one theme. It all boils down to this one theme. God is so good. That is the narrative of my life. That is the story and I'm sticking to it. Come hell or high water, rain or shine. I have a job or don't have a job. I'm healthy or I'm sick. God is so good. Because I know how good God is to me. There's nothing good in me. But God has been so good to me. And that's my story. That's why when we first had our building in the, in the 196, when we don't have money for the carpet, and then we, we eventually we have money for the carpet, so let's carpet the sanctuary. And I asked the people, but before we do that, let's have a graffiti party. Let's write something on the, on the stage, whatever you want to write, a picture, a family, birthdays, whatever you want to write, a prayer request. And then I know I'll be standing every Sunday in the middle of the stage. And then with bold Letters I wrote there, God is so good. Because I know every Sunday when I'll be standing there, the reason why I could stand and preach the gospel, because God is so good. I am standing in the goodness of my God. And that is my story. That is the narrative I want to live to my family and friends and the church and the people that I pastor. Church, while we're having a hard time, while we're going through this pandemic, God is still good. Come on, somebody. Don't just say God is good all the time when you have a money, when you have a job. Even when you don't go, you go through the, the highs and lows of life, God is still good. Come on, somebody. Because that's optimism. It is an unwavering expectation that our loving God is working in every situation for our future good. Just hang in there. Be patient. We're going to come out of this and you'll be better. I'm telling you, you'll be stronger and you will be blessed more. That is our positive optimism in the Christian point of view. You know, the pessimism, as we all know, is looking at the negative events. Listen to me carefully. As personal and permanent. That's why sometimes you check out. You have some friends like that. That they always have the worst case scenario. Have you noticed? When you have friends like that, they're always thinking, you're out there to get me. You're out there to get me. That's why you are very uh, arm's length when you deal with people. Because you always make it personal. And you think it's going to be permanent. Now, there is this guy, check it out, it's in uh, New York. His name is Dan McAdams, who did the research for 30 years regarding this way of thinking. He coined this term, narrative identity, meaning to say, we tell stories about ourselves. It could be a redemption narrative or a contamination narrative. Let me explain this. Remember probably when you were a kid, your dad or your mom threw you into the pool. That's how you learn how to swim. <laughs> threw you into the pool. You could make that as a redemption narrative. You could say, you know, because of that, when my dad threw me in the pool, I became risk taker. I conquer my fear. And I become adventurer in life. And you're making that story into a redemptive. Or you make it a story like this. When my dad threw me in the pool, that's the reason I don't respect any authority. That's the reason why I don't honor parent. Because of that experience. That people are out there to throw me out. To get rid of me. You watch know what you're doing? is a contamination narrative you could say it like this i got laid off but you know because of that layoff praise god i became uh less uh, uh what you call that 
uh, using my money uh, without budgeting or just charging everything now because that layoff made me realize I don't have money. Because of that layoff, I became patient. And because of that layoff, I started honing my skills, getting back to school, and starting a new career. That could be a redemptive narrative. Or if you get laid off, you make it personal and permanent. Yeah, the wild reason I'm laid off, because I'm a loser. Everyone can see that. I'm a loser. Nobody, nobody, no breaks will come to my life. What you're saying is, that is the narrative of your life. It's going to be redemption, contamination. I want to show you from the scripture. Here's two story. Let's look at the contamination narrative. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report. Everybody say bad report. In the King James Version, evil report. So they brought the people of Israel bad report on the land that they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land every beside divorce. Do you notice their story? It's a contamination story. We're going to be killed in that land. Its inhabitants and all the people we saw in it are great height. That's their story. It's a contamination story of negativity. We saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. You remember Anakin from this Luke Skywalker? They have the force with them. Oh, that's a different story. Who comes from the Nephilim, and we see ourselves like grasshoppers. Check this out. We see ourselves like grasshoppers, and we, and so we seem to them. Have you noticed that? That self-perception. You see things not as they are. You see things as you are. If you see yourself as a loser, defeated, you're not going to amount to anything, you are projecting already to the people that kind of image, and they will, you, you will think, you're out there. I'm not going to get that break. I like what the Bible says. We seem ourselves like grasshoppers. And we saw, we seem to them. Uh, you know what they're saying? We're like grasshoppers, and the way they look at us, we're grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, insects, right? So lethal, you could just step on it. But you know what's the truth? The enemy did not see the Israelites as grasshoppers. The truth is, they're afraid of the Israelites. Because here's the thing, when they entered the promised land in Joshua chapter 7 verse 9, when the people in Canaan finally surrender and the, the, the people of God cross over the promised land, and this is what they said. Remember, remember before crossing to the promised land, they, we, we are like grasshoppers and they think we're grasshoppers, but that is lies. The truth is, now the people in the other side confess and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and then great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in the country are melting in fear because of you, Joshua. The enemy are not looking at Joshua's grasshoppers. No, we're afraid of you guys because the Lord has given you this land. We hear the story of the ten plagues in Egypt. We hear the story of the crossing of the, of the Red Sea. People of God, listen to me carefully. Please take this seriously. When you always complain to God about your life, would you please be careful? God, take it seriously. Did you know there are 10 plagues that God showed to the Egyptian? The power of God, 10 plagues. You know how many times the people of God in the wilderness complain? 10 times. On the 10th time, God said, okay, I, I had it. Those people who've been complaining and complaining, 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 the older generation, you're not going to enter the promised land. You know, somebody once said, be careful what you wish for. You might get it. Remember what they said? We're not able. We're not able. We're going to die here. We're going to die here. We're going to die here. I wish we'd go back to Egypt. Okay, God said, okay, that's what you want. I'm giving it to you. Ten plagues, complain, 
And then God says, okay, we're not going to go. It's only the younger generation, 20-year-old below, who went inside the promised land. And when they went to the promised land, they realized, oh my gosh, we're afraid of them. In reality, they're afraid of us. Come on, somebody. If you're a child of God, let me tell you, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Come on, somebody. The devil is afraid of you. You should not be afraid of the devil because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Come on, somebody. And that's the truth. But because of that narrative that you're trying to write in the story of your life, it's a contamination narrative. Look what happened. All the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, if only we had died in the wilderness. Check this out. That's what they asked for. That's what they got. They died in the land of wilderness. And some of them died on the way back to Egypt. That's why I'm saying this to all of us. The danger of having this grasshopper mentality, feeling sorry for yourself. Can you show it on the screen, that grasshopper mentality, that you, uh, you are little, put it back there. You know, like the grasshopper, right? I'm just going to tell this story. Uh, you know, Pastor Ariel is very, a uh, little bit silly. When Lani came to America, like me and Lani were fiancé visa, came to America, petitioned by our, by our, our, our love, our partner, our significant other. So when they, Lani came to here in, in L.A., they were having their uh, trip in L.A., honeymoon, and uh, Pastor Ariel took her to IHOP. And so uh, Lani said, <laughs> What's this I have? Oh, that's a famous restaurant. But before you enter, you need to I hop. Because that's the only way for you to enter I hop. And so Lani, okay, how many times? <laughs> and then you know what? This is a revelation for me. You know what grasshoppers do? They hop. They hop. And some people are like grasshoppers. Because you're having a crisis, you hop back to the old habits of drinking, substance abuse, going back to that relationship. You're hopping, and you're not standing. You're hopping, and you're hopping. Don't be a grasshopper. Be a God hopper. Don't check it out in English because I just invented that. I can say that because I was not born and raised here. Don't be a grasshopper mentality. Be a God hopper. Hopper, you're not hopping, hopping, hopping. Say, say, go there, go there, go there. No, I have an anchor, an anchor to my soul. I'm solid. I'm standing on God. Not, I'm not be hopping and hopping. Whatever people said, we have, we need to have that, especially to our kids, because the grasshopper mentality is everywhere. So now, that's the contamination narrative. Look at the redemption narrative. The story that the, the minority are trying to paint. Listen to what Caleb said. You know, guys, I'm not denying there's giant there. I'm not denying they're going to have a fight. I'm not naive. I'm not denying the coronavirus. I'm not denying that people are dying. I'm not denying that there are people got laid off. I'm not denying we're going to hard times. But if we obey the Lord, listen to what he said. If we obey the Lord, he will surely give us that land rich with milk and honey. So don't rebel. Do you know that complaining is an act of rebelling toward God? He said, don't rebel. We have no reason to be afraid of the people who live there. The Lord is on our side. And they won't stand a chance against us. What is that? He sees his present problems in light of God's promises. In conclusion is this. We need to see the difference between faith and presumption. Hear me out. Please listen to me carefully. Please. Faith doesn't mean that you will not use your common sense. 
Faith doesn't mean, oh, I have faith. That's why I don't wear masks. I have faith. That's why I don't, I don't social distance. No, 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 no. That's presumption. You know what happened to people like that? There's people in, somewhere in Asia. A pastor said, we don't need to be tested. We don't need to take this medication or, or, because we are covered and we are Christian. And they, and they did not do it. And half of the church got infected with the virus. Is that faith? No, it's presumption. Listen to me carefully. So the people, because they were rebuked by Caleb, okay, let's go. Let's go there. But God said, no, 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 no. It's not your time. It's my time. It's not your way, my way. But the people said, no, no, no. We trust the Lord. Let's go now. But that's presumption. Look what happened to them. Chapter 14, verse 44, verse 45. In their presumption, they went up toward the highest point in the hill country, though neither Moses, they not follow the leader, nor the ark of the Lord. The, the presence of God is not with them. Move from the camp. The, the Amalekites, listen to this, and the Canaanites who live in the hill country came down and attacked them and beat them. Because they presume that God is with them. Could you hear me out? There's a pendulum on both sides. There are people on the other side calling me, Pastor, open the church. Pastor, stand for your, what you believe. Let's have church gathering now. Other churches are opening. Let's do it, Pastor. Don't be afraid. Let's do it. God will, will take care of us. That virus thing is no much. To go. I, I, I know that. I believe that. That's where people are coming from. I get emails from that. I get texts from that. I, I got a call from those people. On the other side of the pendulum, there are the people saying, Pastor, don't open the church yet. Until we know that this virus is gone. Until we know it is safe. Could you take a moment? God has called me to pastor those both camps. <laughs> and here's what I'm going to say. So there will be no more question asking me when are we going to open. You know, last week I was crying here during Thursday. And I'm looking at the pictures of people. This place packed with people. I miss that. If, I, if my way will, will be, will, will be uh, just be my agenda to push my way, I'll do it right away. I miss that gathering. But you know what? What I will, not to, I will regret as a pastor if I will not obey what the experts are saying and just do it my way and we gather and half of us or some people got sick inside the church I'm telling you under my conscience I will that will be forever a regret in my life that to see the people that I love got sick because of my presumption and my hard-headedness for now you know how hard it is to preach? I thank God there's a few warriors here, frontliners. How hard it is to preach to an empty room? You don't know if people are watching on you. People, you they mute you already. You don't know if they, if they leave you already and they switch to the Korean drama or they switch to Netflix or they switch there. You don't know. I'm just asking. The, we don't know. I don't know. I cannot see you. It's hard. But what can I do? We are all going through this pandemic. So in the meantime, please, I hope you get me. In the meantime, we're going to follow what the experts are saying. If I came to you tonight and say, hey, my expert opinion, scientific opinion, please don't listen to me. I'm not a scientist. Only Jeff Guderian could say that. But for now, let's be patient just a few more weeks. 
We don't want to forfeit this promised blessing of God just because of our rebellion. I'm just saying this, just a few more weeks. God gave me this promise in Proverbs 19.2. Seal is no good without knowledge. And he who hurries his footsteps misses the mark. The point is this. I'm already suffering. I don't want to suffer for a long time. Just because of my hard-headedness. Because being passionate, oh, let's do this, oh, let's do this. But without good knowledge. You know what we're doing, church? We already ordered those gadgets. It's expensive, all the gadgets, all those uh, Purell and all those things. We all order those gadgets like the thermal scan, uh, no touch, uh, uh, detecting the temperature, that when we reopen, there'll be people standing there and they will check on you without touching you, right? And you will have the mark. No, <laughs> just kidding. And you just, uh, we will know if your temperature is high. Why are we doing that? Because we want us to transition safe so that all our family, when they go to church, they could just enjoy the presence of God and worship without any fear, knowing that this is a safe place and we have done what we should be doing. So church, Seal is no good without knowledge. And beside you, I want you to let you know, church, God is taking care of us. In the midst of this calamity, I'm telling you how the Lord has tremendously blessed us. Because I believe God's will, you do it in God's way. And you do it according to God's time. So for the meantime, church, let us just be faithful, endure to the end. So, so that's my, my, my point and my, what I'm standing as your pastor. Wait until we get the final go signal. We'll regather together. We'll do the, the proper way. But for the meantime... Seal without knowledge is dangerous. He who harries his footsteps misses the mark. I don't want to miss the mark. So while we are social distancing, can I tell you this? Stay connected to hopeful friends. The danger with social distance, if you're alone, I'm telling you, it's a breeding ground for depression. Isolation is not good. God said it's not good for men to be alone. And if you're social distancing and, and you're not connected to a friend, to a family, that's why I'm asking our leaders, text is good, but calling them and hearing your voice is the best. I just want to applaud my wife every Sunday after church. She will have a Zoom meeting right after church. Just to check on her life group. Because people is more important than preference. Our preference is in, in person. We love to eat. Hi, hi. But we cannot do it for now. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to connect with our people who are already dying. Some of them are depressed. Some of them are losing hope. Just to see your face. Just to hear your voice. Say hi, hello, text. Let's do it. That's how we're going to still connect with our family, with our friends. I applaud you, brother, Pastor Arby, the other day. Last night, they have a youth hangout by a Zoom. And I, Pastor Arby was saying, it's fun, Pastor Arby. At first, it's awkward. Then uh, Jessica has a lot of Zoom games that you could let the kids interact. Thank you, Lani, for meeting with the kids. I applaud you, my beloved Raymond, for doing that. Every month, we will have his meeting with their young married with. Just to connect. Last Sunday, I attended our Charisma Marys Bills 11th year anniversary. Praise God for you, sis Pastor Sheila. Pastor Sheila, I honor you. Every day, you're showing up, doing your devotion, video tape, video, uh, taking video of yourself and sending message to your people. You're pastoring well in times of pandemic, Pastor Sheila. I just want to applaud you. 
That Sunday, 3, 3 p.m., said, Pastor, would you join our Zoom meeting and greet our people? It's our 11th year anniversary. What's the point? There's a way to get connected to technology. So here is three things I want to leave. How do you handle bad news? You could handle it with fear. You could handle it with presumption. Don't check the facts. Or you could handle it with faith. Stay in the middle. There is this African impala, one of the mightiest creatures in the safari, could jump up to 10 feet high. Just 10 feet high. But you know, you see this creature inside the zoo, in cave, enclosed, with a three foot wall. You know why? She, it's three feet wall. He could just jump over the wall, but she, she will not, he will not jump. Because he, he will not jump if he could not see where it, he will land. Because he is living by sight. The African impala can jump to a height over 10 feet, yet the, these magnificent creatures can be kept in an enclosed any zoo with a three foot wall. The animals will not jump if they cannot see where their feet landed. We are not animals. We are the children of God. We live not by what we see. We live by what we believe. We live by faith and not by what we see. How do we handle bad news? See it in the light of God's promise. What is the promise about the bad news? The righteous will never be shaken. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. The Bible doesn't say you will not listen to bad news. You can listen. You will know it. But you're not going to fear. Because the promise of God holds the biggest the biggest authority in your life. Not what CNN, not what CDC, not the White House, not any news media. The promise of God is your biggest authority. You know who said that? King David. King David heard a lot of bad news in his life. <laughs> People are trying to get him. Even his own son trying to kill him. So when it comes to hearing bad news, this guy had it. But what he said? I have no fear of bad news because I confidently trust in the Lord. And you know what he said? I've been young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor begging for bread. Speaking this over to all of us, people of God. That's why we should not be panicking and, 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 and hoarding. That's a spirit of fear. We've been young. I've, Listen to me, I'm a 55-year-old man. I've been through some experience in my life that I thought that would be the end of my life. And the Lord reminded me, remember those days that you thought it's the end? How I save you? I'll do it again. But the issue here is trust. You know, like a yo-yo, sometimes this is how we, we connect with God. You know the word trust means to let go. Our problem is when we feel afraid, God, I'll trust in you. Here's my problem. Oh, I take it back. Lord, here's my worries. Lord, here's my worries. Oh, God, I take it back. That's our problem. We give it to God and then we take it back. Trust means you let it go. Here's my worries, Lord. It's yours. I don't even want any ties with my worries, Lord. Giving it to you, God. That's not my problem anymore. Before, the problem is in my hand. But now, God, I let it go. It's yours. You know, there's this one pastor that I admire. Man of God. Every time he's in problem, worry, money matters, things like that. 
he will go outside of the house and will look up to heaven. God, your property, your son is in danger. Save me. I hope that kind of faith. God, your boy, your girl, rescue me. I'm yours. You know, when they're about to enter the promised land, there was a time God wanted to start a new human race with Moses. Because God had it. God had had it with the rebellion, the complaining, and said, God told Moses, hey, Moses, I'm going to start a new race with you. And the rest of these people will just die in the wilderness. You know what Moses said? If you do that, God, you know what your enemies in Egypt will tell? Here's Moses, a man of wisdom. God, if you let us all die and, and, and save me and the rest will die, the enemies in Egypt will say, see what the God of the Israelites did? Took them out from bondage and killed them all in the wilderness. Is that the reputation you want to have, God? That your enemies will tell you, you're not good. Look, you kill all your children. So Moses said, said God, have mercy. That's why the, the 20 and be, uh, below went to the other side, to the promised land. Because Moses said, I want even your enemies to know you're a good God, and that is your glory, and that's what you are known for. Charisma, can I just tell you this? If God went all the trouble of sending his only son to die a cruel death of punishment, God went through all the trouble of losing his only son for us, don't you think he will take care of your Bills? Don't you think he will take care of the future of your kids, the, the college tuition? Don't you think the future of us? If God went through all the trouble of losing his only son to save us, if God did not spare his son, how much more will he freely give us all things? I'm just going to say this. Sorry, Sheila, I didn't ask permission. Remember you were look, waiting for your daughter to have your first daughter, your only daughter, for 10 years. And one time you're having a little bit hard time with Audrey, you're trying to tease her, we're gonna give you away, or you're not obeying. And then Audrey look at you, you waited for me for 10 years? And you're just gonna give me away? Isn't that smart, right? <laughs> God took all the trouble of sending his son dying at the cross and rising from the dead that's why you have no fear church the righteous will never be shaken they do not fear bad news like a yo-yo throw it to the Lord don't take it back let it go and leave it in the hands of God. I want to ask our worship team to come. And we're going to sing the blessing. Because I want us to sing this in faith. In the time of pandemic. In the time of hardship. That the Lord will pronounce a blessing. The blessing is can go even not just to the third and fourth, but to the thousand, thousand generation. Church, God already had in mind how to take care of your children, how to take care of your children's children. God already figured out how He will provide. Rest assured, the righteous will never be shaken. They do not fear bad news, for they confidently trust in the Lord that God will take care of us church God took care of our biggest problem 
sin. He wiped our sins by sending His only Son, Jesus Christ. If God took care of our biggest problem, don't you think He cannot take care of, of the money, cannot take care of the job, He cannot take care of the future, cannot take care of the healing? God is a good, good God. Believe me. I've, I can say to you stories upon stories. Time will not allow me. But God has been so good. He's a good, that will be the narrative, the story of our life. Not the contamination, but the redemption story. Yes, we have, we're going through the fire, but we'll come out victorious in this.
You know why that song is so powerful? It is the Word of God. It is the will of God. And that is the heart of God. In the midst of this pandemic, and all you see is like doom and gloom scenario, the Word of God is saying to you, may His favor be upon you for a thousand generation to your family and your children and their children and their children may His presence go before you behind you beside you all around you within you He is with you He is with you and in the morning and in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing, He is for you. That is the narrative. That is the narrative, the story of God. He's not out there to get you. That's the narrative of the devil to steal, to kill and destroy. That's the narrative of the enemy. Contamination. But the narrative story of God for you is redemption. He wants you to be blessed. And God wants you to bless you, your family, your children, your, and your children's children. That wherever you go, the favor of the Lord is following you. Even in the midst of the pandemic, God is covering you with His favor and His presence. And I want to speak that over you today. And I want you to believe with me like Caleb. Even though you're the only one believing, stand for that belief. Later on, you will see what you believe. The world says, see before I believe. But in the Lord, I ask you to believe first. Then God will show you. God will show His goodness upon your life. I have been young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor begging for bread. The righteous will never be shaken. They will not fear bad news because they confidently trust in the Lord that God will take care of them. Receive this from the Lord today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I speak the favor of the Lord. And if you've been sick because of this COVID-19, I plead the blood of Jesus by His stripes. Be healed in Jesus' name. If you're going depression, anxiety because of, the dip, of this COVID-19, I speak the joy of the Lord is your strength. Rise and come out of that of the depression for the spirit of the Lord is love, joy, sound mind, peace, and not fear. And I, if you have lost your job, I'm praying for you right now. God is a redemption story for you. There will be a better jobs ahead of you. You will be amazed how God will provide for you. And if you have not accepted Jesus into your life, today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. You just say, Lord, I come to you. I admit I am a sinner. I'm lost without you. I invite you into my life. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and rewrite the story of my life. From death to life. From weakness to strength. From poverty to prosperity. From favor to upon favor, upon favor, upon favor, upon favor, upon favor. That will be the narrative and the story of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, now, right now, wherever you are, Jesus has come into your life. Would you type it in, agree with me? That's how we connect that I pray that prayer of the favor of the Lord be upon me. Just type in, favor of the Lord is upon me. Would you just all type it in? All of us, favor of the Lord is upon me. Everybody say, speak, favor of the Lord is upon me. Amen.